Welcome to a new episode of Minds Between Languages. Today we talk to Jan Louis Kruger, Professor of Translation Studies at Macquarie University, and discuss audiovisual translation and the cognitive processing of subtitles. Good morning, Jan Louis. It's great to see you. And Hi, Anne Coupe. Yes, and you too. Thanks. I'm, re I'm really happy to talk to you because I feel we share an interest in multimodality, right? You're an expert in audiovisual translation. And maybe just to start, what is audiovisual translation actually? What is different from, how is it different from translation? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting uh, concept. I think uh, audiovisual translation has developed quite a lot in the last 20 years or so. So it's, it's more well known now than it, than it was a while ago. But um, yeah, I've, I've been teaching uh, and researching audiovisual translation for uh, almost two decades now. And uh, the, I, I think it's one of the most rewarding areas in, uh, in translation studies, uh, mainly because of the fact that you don't only translate the dialogue in a film. You, uh, that's essentially what appears in the subtitles, but it always coexists with the, with the rest of the film. So it's about the, uh, the soundtrack, everything on the soundtrack is there. Uh, which is good and bad, and the same with the visuals. It's, it's always supplements, uh, but sometimes it competes as well. And I think mm -hmm. that's where things become a little bit more interesting is when we start looking at uh, at how the, all the modalities work together and people can still make sense uh, of what they see. But audiovisual translation essentially is all the modes that are used to make an audiovisual text, but not only text, also context, mm -hmm accessible to people who are uh, excluded from full access, we could say, for any reason. And that could be for linguistic reasons, they don't understand the language. It could be for physical reasons. So because of some disability, uh, loss of hearing, loss of sight, something like that. Uh, or it can simply be circumstantial. It can be you, you're busy cooking and uh, you just listen and therefore audio description might work. Uh, and or you sit and you you don't have the sound on because somebody else is listening to something or you're on a train uh, and you can just read the subtitles. So uh, it's it's not just one type of audience. It's it's not just for deaf and hard of hearing people and or for blind people. Uh, it's there's a variety of applications. Now you've mentioned a couple of notions here. You said uh, I mean you mentioned audiovisual translation. You mentioned subtitles. You mentioned audio description. Um, are there different forms of audiovisual translation? Yeah, so audiovisual translation, I think uh, it started off, um, or let's say in the 1980s, people started talking about it more, and then all kinds of terms were used, like um, media translation, I think, was one term at some point. Uh, but audiovisual translation has become quite well established now as a term to, to refer to all of these different modes. The main one, uh, or the main ones, uh, I would say, are probably subtitling uh, and dubbing, lip sync dubbing. So we we find dubbing in certain countries, dubbing is more dominant than subtitling. I think typically in in Germany, in France, uh, in in where you have a really strong language community, you tend to have dubbing as as a dominant form. Where you have a small language like Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, uh, Dutch. They, it tends to subtitles tend to be preferred, but that's also changed a lot. Uh, we with the with the streaming platforms, we see uh, Netflix and and others other companies start uh, dubbing more things. Also, if it's in a language other than English, yeah. uh, and and subtitling is has become so prevalent that you can switch it on even if you don't need it. Uh, so subtitling. Okay, so I've mentioned subtitling and, and dubbing mainly. Uh, there's also voiceover, mm -hmm. which is uh, essentially where you don't have actors lip syncing uh, voice actors. You have somebody who speaks the translation, but it's kind of the original audio is just uh, turned off and then somebody starts speaking the word. So you have one person speaking all the all the characters, uh, essentially. And uh, that's still quite dominant in... Countries like Poland, for example, they use that uh, quite a lot, but uh, it's not, I wouldn't say that's one of the dominant forms of audiovisual translation. 
And then of course, you've got audio description for the blind and visually impaired. And that's essentially where you uh, where you have to substitute for the fact that people don't have full access or any access to the visuals. So anything on screen that's relevant has to be put into words, has to be described. You're translating yeah. pictures in that. In exactly, that. yes. Um, and with, with film, that's interesting because um, we know that the for people who are sighted, uh, the, the images tell a story. So it's not only about describing objectively what you can see on screen. It's also about seeing how those images are presented. So if you have uh, a specific camera angle, then that tells you something. Uh, certain editing techniques tell you something. So then it becomes really tricky because you have to you have to be aware of all of those things when you try to make it accessible for blind and visually impaired people. Now we have in our YouTube videos, you know, in the Minds Between Language YouTube videos, now we have introduced captions, I mean subtitles, but they're machine generated. And yeah. I was wondering in how far this is different from human generated subtitles. Are there differences? Yeah, there they are. Unfortunately, there are quite a few differences. It's a good solution for just basic accessibility, I would say. But I think the some of the biggest drawbacks of auto-generated captions are uh, that essentially it's speaker-independent speech recognition. So you have software and AI uh, that does the transcription from speech to text. So for that reason, there will always be some errors. Uh, it's it's never perfect, but you can fix that with a, with a little bit of post editing. So that's that's not it, I don't think it's insurmountable that in itself. The other difference is that when you um, when you have auto generated subtitles, essentially you have two lines fill up, and then the subtitle changes to a new subtitle. So the line divisions are not very coherent always. Uh, either between two lines or between two subtitles. It's, it's not as well segmented as with human-generated subtitles where the subtitler will make sure that the, the lines and the subtitles are broken uh, or split up at, at points where you have some semantic unit. Typically, you do it in sense units, so in phrases or in sentences, the subtitles. And in order generated, that doesn't always happen. The other big thing, of course, is, is the speed. If you have a speaker who speaks really fast, then uh, the the subtitles will be very fast. Every word that's said will be subtitles. And we know that if you have spontaneous speech, that's not always very coherent. You have lots of fillers and you have half sentences and interruptions and, and false starts. Like what I've been saying now, I've, this was a massively long sentence. So it's not that easy for somebody to read a sentence like that. We're used to listening to language in a certain way, but when you read it, you have to uh, kind of try to keep in your short-term memory what you've just read. And if the sentence is really long and it's two, three, four, five subtitles, then you can't remember what was in the first three subtitles. So that that's a big problem. Uh, I think the speed's probably the biggest issue with the auto-generated stuff. It's a cheap way to do it. And it does provide access, as I said, but I think one should always be careful if you do that, do it in a way that you have some control, that you can you can go and at least clean up the language and mm -hmm. maybe just break up the sentences into shorter sentences so that it's easier to read. So, but that means also as an audiovisual translator, what you're doing in a way is also pre-processing the sentences, breaking them up in idea units so that they can be read more easily. So there's a lot of cognitive processing actually that is going on beforehand. Exactly, yes. And the other thing is that uh, subtitles are very often uh, edited down quite significantly just mm -hmm. to bring down the speed. So if the speech rate is too high, the subtitle will go in and try and rephrase what's been said in such a way that you use fewer words, less characters, fewer characters uh, and shorter sentences, which means that it's it really takes a long time. It's very time intensive. When when I teach subtitling to my students, um, they start off at maybe doing five minutes in a week. And then by the end of the course, they can maybe do five minutes in a couple of hours. But typically a professional subtitler, if they start from scratch without a transcript, would it would take them uh, about a full work day to do maybe an hour if they could, an hour of subtitled material. 
So it, it takes a long time to do it because of those constraints. You've got space constraints. You're limited to two lines of text. You're limited to uh, roughly 37 to 42 characters per line. Mm -hmm. And those are fairly hard rules in subtitling for technical reasons. So you've got that. And then you have speech rates. You can't really go subtitles over 20 characters per second. Then it becomes hard to read. And I'll say more about that later. Uh, but all of these things means that human-generated subtitles take a lot of effort to do because there's so much that has to be done to deal with these technical constraints. Whereas a machine, of course, doesn't need to worry about that. It's just about, it's essentially just the transcript that is timed. If you have access to the audio um, and the subtitles are also there, then the subtitles act as a support. But if you fully reliant on the subtitles, then it's different. Then you're going to struggle if it's too fast, if the language is incoherent, uh, anything like that. We've been talking now about a, the cognitive load of the audiovisual translator, but actually most of your research has focused on how the users process subtitles and captions. What does your research tell you about this information processing? Yeah, you're right. What we've done has mostly been reception. And most people working on audiovisual translation started off using eye tracking from very early on from the 1980s. Uh, Jerry de Davala in, in Belgium started using eye tracking to look at subtitles, how people look at, at subtitled films. Uh, but a lot of the attention in, in the early studies was really on attention allocation and distribution. So what proportion of time do people spend looking at the subtitles versus the image, for example? And then there's been some work on, on how subtitles are being read and then also on cognitive load, uh, studies like uh, using post hoc measures, self-reports, where you simply ask people after they watch the subtitle film uh, to rate their own cognitive load. And you ask another group who didn't see the subtitles to also do the same to see where the subtitles increase the cognitive load. What we've learned, uh, if, I, if I have to give a very brief summary <laughs> of uh, a number of years of work, in a couple of lines, what we've learned is really that if there are increasing demands, so if the subtitles are faster, if the image is more complica complicated to process, if the viewer doesn't understand the source language, so they're reliant on the subtitles, then of course it, it takes more effort. So in all of those cases where the demands increase, you see more superficial processing of the subtitles. So people start making fewer fixations shorter fixations and longer saccades as well, which means that you start prioritizing different things and you start skipping more words, which means that the processing is unavoidably more shallow. And, yeah. and, and does that also mean in some way that they may be looking or paying less attention to the, to the image? Definitely, yes. I say yes, but it, it also depends. If, if, if it's a very fast speech rate, which means that you've got fast subtitles and they, there's very little gap between subtitles, then in that case, people don't really have much time to look at the screen. Mm -hmm. They will still try to do it because you, can, you can't look at film, watch a film and not look at the screen. But it's very difficult to do that. What happens is you, you have um, attentional blindness, essentially. Mm -hmm. So people like Pablo Romero Fresco calls it uh, subtitle blindness. And uh, there have been a few studies on that which essentially means that because of the way uh, the limitations of the cognitive cognitive architecture or the your perceptual uh, limitations you there's no way that you can look at the, at the subtitles and still see what happens on screen and if you spend more time looking at the subtitles it means you're going to miss more on the screen and and that's why subtitles in Scandinavia has traditionally been very slow like 12 characters per second because the rationale was that you should have enough time to read the subtitle and then go up to the screen and return to the subtitle if you haven't completed or if you need to disambiguate something or look at something more properly. But uh, nowadays on Netflix, for example, English, uh, the standard is about 20 characters per second, uh, which is still doable, but then a good proportion of the subtitles are faster than that. Uh, which means that it it becomes a reading exercise if the subtitles are really fast. Uh, in a film, definitely, uh, a lot of what we see in film is visual, or a lot of uh, what makes a film 
what it is, is the visual input. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't afford to distract people too much from, from that visual input. Now, what, what, you, what you've explained is that processing subtitles on one hand requires you to split the attention between the, the audio and the video. And then you need to reintegrate this information again, the information from the subtitles, the information from the from the video. Um, it's quite interesting also to research, right? I mean, how do you research those different processes? That is, I think it's the most interesting part of the work that we're doing at the moment is that it's trying to understand how people divide their attention, how they how they manage to allocate resources to all of the sources that have to be processed. The perceptual limitations means that we we need to understand, and we've done some studies, uh, dual task studies, where we have subtitles and then we have a secondary task where people have to monitor the screen for, uh, say, a letter changes. Uh, you have a letter appearing in the center of the screen and then every every second, but then somebody people have to press a button uh, if the letter changes color. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they have to read text. And then we have a slightly harder task where they have to monitor the letter for changing from a, a consonant to a vowel. Um, and the color change you can still do in your peripheral vision, but the vowel change you can't. You have to look at it. And I think that's the uh, the most important thing. We've uh, tried to formulate something of a, a cognitive model called the Multimodal Integrated Language Framework, which tries to account for these things. The fact that while you're watching film, there are certain cognitive processes that happen uh, in parallel. You can read subtitles while you listen to the soundtrack. You can read subtitles while you monitor for for major changes in your peripheral vision. So you can see if there's a shot change without looking away from the subtitles. You can you can see that there's a, a shot change, or if something if there's a sudden movement on screen, you can pick that up in your peripheral vision. But then there are other things that you have to do in serial. So it has to be serial processing, just like reading. And reading, you you can't just look at one sentence and in one fixation take in all the information you need. You have to look at a word, identify the words so that you can integrate the meaning before you can go on to the next word and identify that word and then extract the meaning there. So it, it has to be serial. You have some perceptual span, which means that you can see more than just where you're looking at, but that's only about what's it, nine, 13 characters to the right of where you're looking when you're reading. So within that span, so about two words, you can you can identify words in your peripheral vision there or in your perceptual span. Uh, but there's no way that you can read while you're looking at the screen. And there's no way that you can look at the screen and extract detailed information while you're reading the subtitles, which means that you constantly have to switch your attention. So eye tracking gives us a very good tool to do that, to look at that, see how many times people switch between the subtitles and the image. You can see how they process the visuals. There are quite a few models out there about visual processing. Uh, the fact that when, when you have a new scene that you have to process, uh, you have broad processing first. So you have a few short fixations spread out across the screen, and then you identify the, the area where you need to extract more information. And then you you go into that area, and then you have longer fixations in that area as you try to extract the relevant information. So what we're interested in investigating now is how those visual routines change when you have to read subtitles, because mm -hmm. you, you don't have the time to do that. You, you're not just processing the visuals. You have to very quickly do a broad processing of the visuals, then you have to return and read the subtitles. And only once you finish doing that, because you can't interrupt your reading either. You have to try and finish the whole subtitle. Once you've done that, you can return, but then you have to do a very quick broad processing again before you go into the details. So there's no question that doing that is going to have some cost. And, and that's what we're trying to, to understand is what, what is the nature of that processing cost? But so I, I understand you correctly that basically having the, the, the image and the text on the same sensory channel in a way would increase the costs or this is what what you're expecting yes yeah tech, in, in in theory yes uh it does because as we know you we have uh, we have auditory and visual processing and if you then have the text plus the image as you say in the same 
channel, then theoretically that would increase the load on that channel. But yeah. it's not that simple either because of the fact that, that we can integrate things. Very interesting. Now, um, see, I live in a country now where um, usually movies are subtitles in two different languages, in German and French usually. And I was wondering about the cognitive costs of that for my uh, viewing experience, let's say. Does it, what is the impact on me or what is the impact? That, does it matter in a way if I know both languages, just one language? When you have bilingual subtitles, then there have been a few, few studies on that. Uh, my colleague Sishin Lao uh, did, this, did her master's degree on bilingual subtitles, English and, and Chinese. So the, the issue is that when you have bilingual subtitles, they are designed for people who doesn't understand one of the two languages, mm -hmm. essentially. So they are timed in such a way that you will have enough time to read one of the two. So if you want to read both, you need to read very fast. And that's where it becomes tricky if you understand both. And, and it's the same thing. I mean, we forget that subtitles are in the first instance created to give people access who wouldn't have had access without the subtitles. So you get lots of complaints from people, for example, if the subtitle doesn't say exactly what the audio said. And now we're talking about same language subtitles, yeah. subtitling for different out of hearing, and then people complain, but they use a different word in the subtitle. And they don't realize that it's been done in order to save some time so that the subtitle can, uh, can be at a, at a slower rate. Uh, but when you have the bilingual subtitles, I think that's one of the, the problems is that it's inevitable that if you understand both languages that you're going to want to compare it. But that is going to impact your enjoyment. It's going to impact your immersion because then it becomes a, a language exercise and not so much a, a viewing exercise. Uh, if you talk to people about subtitles, almost everybody has a story about subtitles. So you either complain about it or, or they'll say how they've used it to learn language even though there's very little empirical evidence that that's actually the case. And the, the reality of this is if, you, if you're learning a language, what takes the most time is the vocabulary. So you have to acquire the vocabulary. And in order to do that, uh, anybody with any language uh, learning or teaching background will be able to tell you is you need a lot of repetition. You need to see that same word multiple times and you need to use that word in a certain context. So subtitles uh, is, are good because they give you contextualized language. It's contextualized and it has a visual context as well and an auditory context. So it's, it's a full con context. It's, it's almost uh, like a simulated reality. So it's, a, it's an ideal way to acquire language, but at the same time, you need a lot of repetition for that to happen. So it's been used in India quite extensively by a, a colleague of ours, um, Brij Kutari, uh, who has been working on this for more than two decades on using subtitles for mass literacy. So putting subtitles on popular uh, music videos, for example, and then showing that to people in remote areas who have low literacy skills. And, and they've shown how this is, and he, he has at the moment a massive project where they trying to roll that out uh, over an, a number of regions in uh, in India and try to see what the impact is on literacy development through using the subtitles. Now, it's been so successful, I think, in, in his early work because of the fact that they used music videos. So people already know the words. And then, and, and of course, music is repetitive. You've got that refrain, uh, the chorus. And, and because the words repeat multiple times, and they know the words, they can make that match between what they hear and what they read. And they get a lot of repetition of these words. So uh, doubtlessly, there are uh, benefits in this, in the fact that you have information in both the auditory and the visual, and you can somehow integrate those. But then there are also costs. There are redundancy costs, and this is the bilingual subtitles comes back to that. Um, there is an educational psychology in instructional design. There's the cognitive theory of multimedia learning yeah. uh, by Maya. And they talk a lot about the redundancy principle, where if you have two sources of information and they're redundant, then 
your cognitive load will increase. And this is what happens when you have bilingual subtitles is that you uh, a lot of your cognitive effort goes into comparing those two. And, and that's inevitable. As soon as you have two sources, you're going to try to integrate those two and that's going to create higher load. Um, now, since you mentioned this, the switching costs just before, um, is there actually any work or has there been any work on trying to put the subtitles just, let's say, next to the visual focus or something like that? I mean, you, you understand my idea to not have yeah, them at yeah, the bottom yeah. of the screen, but to move yes. them where people would look at? That's right. And and there has actually been some work on that. Uh, Wendy Fox, she worked on, on um, integrated titles. And integrated titles, the idea was to, they did some eye tracking to see where people would be looking, but you can also, just based on the scene composition, on the mise-en-scene, on where the action is, uh, where the faces are, you can predict where people are going to look. And there's been some work on that um, and then creating subtitles that would be integrated with the film. So you try and if somebody speaks, the subtitle is on that person on screen. If uh, but then also they did aesthetic for aesthetic reasons as well. They looked at contrast, screen contrast to make sure the subtitles are visible. There's some logic in that, in that it's a, it's more creative, these subtitles. You can imagine it's much more work to to make. So it'll be much more expensive which means it'll never really happen because nobody in the film industry is willing to do anything that will cost more money unless it's special effects. And I mean, there's some machine learning that you could use or AI uh, to do some of that. But let's say you can do that perfectly. Let's say you can figure out a way to do that perfectly. You have to do it in such a way that you don't cover essential parts of the image. So otherwise you're going to ruin the image as well. And that's a big reason why subtitles are always at the bottom, because it, it tends to be not that much information there. Yeah. And, and this is a convention that we got used to. I mean, in some languages, the subtitles are on the side, uh, vertical. But the the main thing is it's there and it's away from where most of the action happens. So it's out of the way. And also it's predictable. You know where it is. And if you have these integrated titles, then... Uh, we did some eye tracking on on Wendy's study uh, on, on Wendy's work as well. We did uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, one of the Sherlock Holmes, Holmes films, the first half an hour, and she created the integrated titles. And we looked at what happens to the eye movements, and we find that people get to the subtitle faster. So that latency from when the subtitle appears and, until they start reading is shorter. But they also miss more subtitles. They skip more subtitles and. The reason for that is probably because they they don't know where the subtitle is. It's not in a predictable position, which means that every time a subtitle appears, they, they need to, especially if it's not exactly where they were looking, then they have to go and look for it. Whereas if it's at the bottom of the screen in the center, you know it's there. You can just go down when you need it and you can go back to the image. They, they know where to look. They know where to search. That sounds yes. very logical. And I would say also these yeah. are questions that are relevant for... Uh, interpreting, because now one of the hot topics is computer-assisted interpreting. So where you have yeah. basically um, machine-generated suggestions that are popping up in your visual field, so that could be technical word, it could be proper names or so. You certainly have heard about it. Yes. And usually they are displayed kind of at a certain part of your screen, so at the bottom. And something that we tried also was to give um, our participants the possibility to place them wherever they wanted, basically, in their visual field. And what mm. we observed is that many of them actually place them at the bottom again, like subtitles. Ah, okay. And then I've been wondering a little bit, I mean, what are actually the, I, th I thought you might have some ideas on it. Well, what are the similarities or the differences between subtitles and then those computer-assisted interpreting um, inputs, let's say? Yeah, that's a. Uh, this is a really difficult question to answer, <laughs> because uh, because of all the you know the the complex cognitive processing uh, that happens when you interpret, you already have to juggle so many things. So I I get the if you have something like this, you have prompts that come up with say numbers or names or things like that. Um, I think it can be really useful. It's still very different from subtitling, mainly because of the the fact that you don't have 
full sentences you you have words that pop up so it's it's kind of decontextualized not really because you can hear the context but it's uh, it's a different kind of processing when you read sentences you identify the words you do the word recognition and recognition identification and then integration of the words and you do that until you've accumulated all the words in the sentence and then you can integrate the meaning of the sentence into your long-term memory if you have prompts then that doesn't really happen because you have only single words that come up now the idea behind this of course is to reduce the memory burden so that the memory burden but also names that are maybe difficult to hear you can see the transcript on. the thing is that you uh, there are a few factors that might make it difficult um i haven't done a great deal of interpreting in my life but the few times that i did uh when i was given a script i found it much harder because now you're processing two different texts they very similar but they're not the same and you constantly have to if you lose where you are in the one text then you lost if you if you tend to look at the text the written text and the speaker deviated from that in any way, then it's very difficult to find your place again. Now, it's different if it's just prompts. If you just have prompts, they like little memory helpers, little crutches that help you to, to get uh, difficult terms or not to have to remember a long number. And, and that's very useful if they are correct. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's speech recognition. That's not always the case. That's true, uh, yeah. They have to be correct. And the other thing is also in most speech recognition applications, there is a bit of a delay. So mm -hmm. you have a synchronization issue that it, if it takes too long for the speech recognition software to transcribe the word and to check in the context that it's the right word, then uh, the word might pop up when you no longer need it or you've already processed the end of the sentence and the word from the beginning of the sentence only pops up then, which means that it kind of disrupts your sentence integration. I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, spitballing here. I have no idea. But these are the things that I think we do need to investigate. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking a little bit at the time. I feel like we need to wrap up. Yes. Um, maybe just as a last question, is there something that you that you learned about our minds um, that really kind of surprised you or amazed you through your research? Yeah, I I do think so. I think what what amazes me is still the the fact that the human mind is so uh, so amazingly adaptive that we can process really difficult things uh, like like an audiovisual text, like a film where you have to integrate speech written speech, spoken language, soundtrack, uh, moving images, all kinds of things you have to integrate and make sense of. And we found really interesting things um, at redundancy, for example, where you have to integrate things and you would expect that to have a bigger impact. You, you will expect subtitles to have a negative impact on people, uh, on people's understanding or enjoyment or cognitive load. Uh, so we're higher load. But what we constantly find is that subtitles don't increase the load. They actually reduce the load. And and the reason for that is probably that you have a more stable source, a source of information. It's it's always there, especially if you don't need it all the time. It's a handy thing to refer to. So that, I think, is is really interesting, how people can juggle and integrate things, how if the demands on one mode become too heavy, you can extract more information from another mode to supplement that and still make sense of it. Even if you've only read half the subtitle, you can still understand what's being said just by reading two or three words because you integrate it with what you've seen and with what you hear as well. Um, so that, but then at the same time, it's fine if we ask people, um, if we ask questions such as what can people cope with, it's a different question from what, when is a film not optimal? So people can deal with really fast subtitles, with really difficult editing in a movie as well, because some experimental films especially are, are really challenging. They can do that, but even if they can do that, 
what is the impact on their enjoyment? What is the impact on their immersion? I think that that becomes interesting because there is a cost. Even if we can cope with it, there is a cost. And watching a film, making a film accessible is, is not uh, an exercise in building people's stamina. It should be something that facilitates their enjoyment, facilitates their understanding. So I think in audiovisual translation, like in interpreting, you want to give the listener uh, a language that's easy to pass, that's easy to, to understand, to integrate. And anything that you do that works against that, whether that's your intonation, whether it's the length of the sentences you use, will somehow hamper their their enjoyment and even their understanding of the text that they've that they have. But I I think in terms of audiovisual translation, if I can end on that, what I've also uh, realized over the last few years is exactly what what responsibility audiovisual translators have. They come in and add an additional source of information that mediates, that makes something accessible that would not have been accessible. And this is often done right at the end of the production process. But it's very easy for that product that you add, that augmented product, to destroy the original product. I I think that's one of the most important things for us to remember is something like audiovisual translation has to be, has to respect the source text and has to create something that is not worse than the original, something that's enhanced and that that's not ruined. You don't have a, a really um, a, a labor of love, a very expensive film that's been created over a year or a few years, and then poorly made subtitles simply destroy it. Absolutely, I would definitely agree with that. Thank you so much, Ian Louis, for for your time. It was a pleasure to talk to you. You're welcome. That was a pleasure for me as well.